need to prepare ourselves for a much different kind of warfare requiring different kinds of capability and really a different kind of mindset. 3,000? There's not really ever going to be a going back to the old way if we're going to protect America. You're not suggesting that when we tell ourselves the United States military is the greatest fighting force the world has ever known, that we're kidding ourselves. Yes, because while we do many, many things very well, we have limitations. Those limitations are evident today in Iraq and in Afghanistan. The enemy never knows whether he's being watched or not. Get the guy in the field. Get the guy in the field. Fighters. I want him to be worried all the time about what our capabilities might be. The future of the U.S. military, tonight on Dan Rather Report. Good evening. Tonight, we'll give you a look at the future of U.S. armed forces. Surprisingly, there's an emerging consensus about what that future should look like. More ground troops to act as police, more capability to fight insurgents in cities. So says Senator John McCain, so says Senator Barack Obama. It's what Army Brass wants, and what editorials urge, and it's already happening. As you'll see tonight, we as a nation are building entire cities in the desert to train soldiers for just such battles ahead. As indispensable today as throughout all military history. The U.S. Army has a glorious history, and most of that glory was earned in one way. Typified by the liberation of France in World War II, the American Army marched in heavily armed columns across swaths of territory. These were wars of defined fronts, and anything ahead of the tanks was fair game. But the Army today is fighting a different kind of war. We're trying to get a nice uh, pulse of, of the town and where they currently stand at this time. And gearing up to fight more. These are wars for hearts and minds, as likely to be fought with a handshake as a gun. Deputy Mayor's over here. Oh, Good. How, How are you doing? The Deputy Mayor. This is a war of counterinsurgency. It entails house-to-house -house searches for illegal weapons. We've got an uh, IED detonator or weapon and a uh, box, 762 rounds so far. Keep looking. And interrogation of high-value targets. Now, I think there was some shooting just not too long ago. But it's also about providing small business grants to local villages. Hey, sir, I found the woman you're looking for. Salam alaikum. I like to say uh, here's, the, here's the baker, if you want to talk to her. We just wanted to uh, let you know that you were approved for your grant. Yeah, you know, and made good tea. Yeah. Scenes like this are all in a day's work for the army in Iraq. But this isn't Iraq. The weapons aren't real. And these towns were constructed by Hollywood set builders. And what you're seeing here is the army's national training center on Fort Irwin in the middle of California's Mojave Desert. And although this seems like a very real interaction between an Iraqi villager and American forces, this Iraqi-American actor works for a government contractor hired to populate the California desert with Arabs. And what's happening here at Fort Irwin is more than just training. It's the army of the world's only remaining superpower fundamentally changing its mission. Fort Irwin rotates between training for Iraq and Afghanistan ten times a year, hosting groups of 6,000 soldiers and officers on their way to those battlefields. Halfway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, it's over 1,000 square miles, bigger than the state of Delaware. We visited during an Iraq rotation and we saw the army building a city on the sand, hundreds of buildings simulating a Middle Eastern metropolis to teach Americans how to win urban combat and win over hearts and minds. Since Fort Irwin opened in 1980, it's trained soldiers for America's next battlefield. During the Cold War, these sands stood in for the plains of Central Europe, 
the place we expected to face the Soviets. Columns of mock enemy tanks remain as reminders. But after 9-11, the army thought it would have to send soldiers into a very different kind of battle, one in which soldiers have to make tough cultural calls on the fly. Listen to this conversation about not barging into the home of a mullah and his wife. Oh, we gotta find a way to get into the, uh, the courtyard, the doors closed. We don't want to be inappropriate if she's home by herself. A far cry from General Patton marching across Europe. As the operational environment has changed, so has our, our, our combat training centers. We have now transformed into being able to make sure that our units are prepared for irregular warfare, uh, which is what's taking place in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, a counterinsurgency environment. Overseeing this whole operation is Brigadier General Dana Petard. It's his job to turn the thousands of young American men and women who pass through Fort Irwin into soldiers who can fight this new kind of war. Stability operations has primacy, but there are still elements of offensive operations and defensive operations, and you'll see that during a rotation here. Stability operations. That's army speak for things like keeping the peace, economic development. Unemployment rates are high, and maybe with a boost of a micro grant, they start the, a business that will help boost the economy. And distributing food and medicine. That one's a little bit heavier. Okay, okay, no problem. Well. While there is training here in fighting and battlefield medicine, What's this one? Let me see. the emphasis, even in combat, is on low intensity military operations in cities. Here, an army patrol searching a neighborhood for a suspected gun runner comes under sniper attack. Hey. Hey. Up top, you gotta talk! Keep firing that window! Get in here! There you go. There you go. We get a patrol coming up from the south. Have them stop and secure the south side. This is another one of our targets we're looking for. This guy is his known friend. Here. The civilian in the background is actually a trainer hired to teach soldiers how to behave with the local population. We questioned them, they gave us false names. But you don't want them to know too much. And here, the trainer warns a soldier about revealing too much when briefing Iraqi soldiers. We see him, be on the lookout for this guy, and we need to capture this guy. And the training extends even to army translators. No, uh, I'm, I never saw them, saw them here before, but they are coming from outside. It's all part of the emphasis on reality, which stretches not just to military realism, but also to architecture, markets, and most of all, language. If you go through and you don't have Arabic-speaking role players, uh, that's an issue because that's not real. Uh, or if it's an Afghanistan rotation and not speaking uh, Pashtun or Dari, that's not real. The kind of towns, the urban towns we're creating, the signs, it must hit all five of your senses. You must see Iraq and Afghanistan, you must smell it, you must touch it. You must hear it, and that's what we're trying to create. We believe in this is Iraq right now. We don't believe in this desert in California, no. When I come in here, when I step in my village, hey, this is my house, this is my village, I live over here. So you guys do whatever you have to do, you're gonna do it in Iraq, do it over here. Bassam Kalisho is one of the hundreds of Iraqi Americans hired to recreate their homeland at Port Urban. We got script, and we play by the script, but sometimes we play free play and put it to them like they're gonna face it in Iraq. Hey. I've been U.S. citizen for a long time. And this country gave me a lot, freedom, nice wife, beautiful kid, my family's here, so I owe this country, so whatever I do over here is not just the money, it's just something, I believe in it, I'm saving life. Kalisho plays the mayor of the fictional Iraqi town of Medina Wassel, and he hopes American soldiers learn from the mistakes they make here, where the bullets aren't real. So when they go to Iraq, they remember, hey, I did in Medina Wassel made that mistake. I killed innocent people. I don't want it to happen over here again. 